oh, by the way, I signed you up for a Spartan race next week. That's how I found out that I'd be competing in a grueling 6.21 obstacle course in less than 10 days. If you're unfamiliar with what Spartan races are, I'll try to paint a picture. Picture all those movies and documentaries you've seen of military basic training or Navy SEALs buds. You know, the monkey bars, crawling under barbed wire, traversing massive walls, climbing ropes, etc. All spread out over a 6.21 mile off-road course. And I definitely mean off-road. We're talking massive dirt hills to climb up and slide down, muddy, freezing cold water to wade and sometimes swim through. But unlike military training, people actually pay to induce this torture upon themselves. If you're wondering what's wrong with these people, well, you're not alone because I certainly question their sanity too. So I replied to him with, um, next week? Well, shit, okay. What time do I need to be there? Sometimes I question my own sanity. Even though I still work out around five times a week, these workouts consist mainly of heavy resistance training and a few 20 to 30 minute zone two cardio sessions a week. I don't care how big your bicep peaks are or how well you can walk on the treadmill while listening to the latest Joe Rogan podcast. It is not going to prepare you for a Spartan race. So, why didn't I panic? Because I have what I believe every successful entrepreneur, athlete, parent, student, etc., has mental toughness. Now, I'm not saying that I'm anything special. I'm a decent athlete, but I never made it to the CrossFit Games or the Mr. Olympia. I was a good student, but I was certainly never valid Victorian. But I've never been someone to shy away from a challenge. Never said no to something just because it was going to be hard or make me uncomfortable. And even though I'm not a famous athlete or a billionaire entrepreneur, I'm extremely proud with what I've done with my life and I'm very, very happy in it. And sadly, these days, that's something very few of us can say. Now, unfortunately, as of today, science doesn't seem to be able to fix what genes you were born with or the neighborhood you were born in or how much money you were born into. But there is more and more science emerging on the topic of mental toughness. And I'm positive I can give you a few tips and tricks to strengthen that mind. So let's dive into that. In their 2015 paper, Gucciardi et al. described mental toughness as a personal capacity to produce consistently high levels of subjective or objective performance despite challenges, stressors, or significant adversities. It's what I've always described as, albeit less eloquently, embracing and enduring the suck. I'm sure you've heard plenty of military guys say embrace the suck, but that endure part, that endure part, I added in. That's my little touch. True mental toughness not only requires you to accept discomfort, but to be able to hang out in it for a little bit so that's the rough rudimentary definition of what mental toughness is. And I'm sure you're thinking, yeah, I already knew that. I thought this was a science of mental toughness. So let's get a little bit more nitty gritty and into the science. Here we go. As we just discussed, mental toughness is the ability to perform under stress at a very high level. But to move along any further, we need to first define and examine what exactly stress is. From a scientific standpoint, stress is when levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine are elevated. These chemicals are both considered neurotransmitters and hormones. And they're actively involved in what's called the sympathetic nervous system. For the sympathetic nervous system, think fight or flight. They essentially allow us to increase our level of focus, our attention, and our ability to move. These catecholamines means, which is just a fancy scientific name for norepinephrine and epinephrine and dopamine, are responsible for all those annoying sensations you feel when you're overly stressed. You know that feeling on edge, heart racing, pit in the bottom of your stomach feeling you get when you're going through a stressful time? Thank catecholamines. So scientifically speaking, mental toughness is the ability to maintain composure and performance through times of elevated catecholamines. Now that we've got that out of the way, you're probably wondering how exactly can mental toughness help you in your life? Even if if you're not, just stick around because I'm going to list some pretty surprising statistics. And after that, if you're super bored, then you can click away. When discussing the science and research surrounding mental toughness, Angelia Duckworth, a PhD, has to be in the conversation. Dr. Duckworth is a researcher, a psychologist, professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, and the author of the best-selling book, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. She's dedicated her entire life to the study of grit, which for all intents and purposes is mental toughness. Through her work, she found that West Point candidates who were one standard deviation higher than their peers on the grit score were 60% more likely to finish the grueling training. She also discovered that Ivy League undergraduate students who had higher grit scores also had higher GPAs despite scoring lower on the SATs and not being as intelligent as others. Similar results were repeated over and over in her literature. I'll link the paper below. But now, let's get to the fun part. You might have guessed it. Deliberately expose yourself to stress. You know those super annoying captions under every IG influencer's post like, 
get comfortable being uncomfortable, do the thing you don't wanna do. Well, unfortunately in this regard, they're actually right. Just like everything else in life, the more exposure you have to something, the less you're actually affected by it. In pharmacology, this is known as tolerance. Another pretty cool scientific phenomenon that I liken it to is something called sensory gating. Are you wearing underwear right now? I bet you had to think about that at least for a second, right? Up until this point, you've been sitting here watching this video completely unaware that you even had anything on down there. That's because neural processes mediated by the pulvinar nuclei of the thalamus and other systems of the brain are constantly filtering out redundant and irrelevant stimuli from ever reaching level of consciousness. When you first threw on those undies this morning, I bet you could feel every inch of them sliding up your legs, cupping those balls and grabbing them firm glutes. <laughs> but as the day went on, you completely forgot that they were even there. Now, this isn't the exact mechanism for a mental toughness, but I've always thought this phenomenon is pretty damn cool. And we're here to talk about science. So I just thought I'd drop this little knowledge bomb so you could be a little bit smarter too. And it really is a very similar mechanism. The actual mechanism for mental toughness is kind of hard to really articulate. Most of the literature on mental toughness is done in the field of psychology. And yes, psychology is definitely a science, but when they're talking about it, they're talking about it more from the lived experience and not diving so much into the neurochemistry. So I'll do my best to try to put it all together after what I've teased out of the literature that's available. Okay, brace yourself, we're gonna get a little nitty gritty here. All effort is mediated through things called neurons. Neurons utilize glucose, think carbohydrate, and electrolytes, think salt, for fuel. If there's not enough glucose and they've become what's considered fat adaptive, well then they can use fat for fuel through the means of what are called ketones, think the keto diet. There's a group of these neurons in the brain stem called the locus ceruleus that pumps out our old friend epinephrine when we're exposed to stressors. This group of neurons also seems to be the governor that allows us to keep going or tells us to quit. And this all happens through another type of cell called glia. When the glia cells determine that the locus ceruleus has released too much epinephrine, it shuts the system down. And that's when we tap out, stop running, drop the weights, you know, quit. So remember when I said mental toughness is the ability to handle more epinephrine? Well, that's the mechanism. Mental toughness comes from the ability to increase the amount of epinephrine that those glial cells are exposed to before they hit the off switch. You know, make epinephrine like those underwear you forgot you were wearing. And now I know you probably want some actual steps, but before doing so, I'll point you towards the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's actually right there on the bookshelf. James states, mental toughness is about your habits, not your motivation. And I couldn't agree more. And though I wish that I could just sit here and talk to you about how habits are going to increase your mental toughness much more than motivation, well, that would pretty much be plagiarizing because James has already written that book. So go read that and I'll try to put a new spin on things. One of the best ways to improve resilience, in my opinion, is through physical effort. And yes, of course, there's much more to mental toughness than just being physically fit, but our cells really don't know the difference between the hormones produced when we're stressed from a workout and the hormones produced when we're stressed from our job. In my opinion, it's probably a better life choice to expose yourself to more epinephrine via physical fitness than to, say, break up with your spouse or go get fired, but... That's just me talking. Choose the stairs over the elevator. I don't care if it's been a long day and you've got a handful of groceries or if yesterday was a grueling leg workout and your legs are sore. Good, as famous Jocko would say, that's the point. It's time to get uncomfortable. When you park your car, park far away, even if near spots are available. Wake up early, uncomfortably early, but also ensure that you're getting enough sleep, which means that you're probably going to have to go to bed early too. Going to bed early for most of us is gonna mean that we're not gonna be able to watch that junk TV or mindlessly doom scroll through Instagram. Stopping yourself from doing that might be a little uncomfortable too, so there you go, you got two for one. When you wake up early, get up immediately. No snooze, no laying in bed to savor the warmth of the bed a little bit longer. When that alarm goes off, sit straight up, get up, get going. Do a cold plunge or a cold shower. Yeah, this sucks. It takes a lot of freaking toughness to be able to take that shower from warm and comfortable and physically reach out, grab that handle and turn it to cold. There's a ton of mental and physical benefits here, none of which I'll get into because I think Huberman has beat a dead horse when it comes to cold plunges and that sort of thing. So if you're into that, 
go watch him after watching this, of course, and after hitting subscribe, of course. Do the extra rep. And no, that likely wasn't failure that you hit on your last set of leg press. In my opinion, very few people have actually ever crossed into that world of hurt that is failure. True failure is when you're on the verge of passing out, when your knees are knocking and it feels like it's taking 15 minutes to get up from the hole of a squat. And then you're left in agony, gasping for air and trying to regain consciousness as you curl up into the fetal position on the floor, rethinking all of your life choices up to this moment. That is true failure. And now by no means am I saying that you need to go to failure every single time. Though I do think it's important for most of us to at least cross that threshold a few times in our life, especially so that we just know what that is and so that we can plan our workouts accordingly. You know, if you're using something like reps and reserve, how can you accurately calculate that if you haven't actually ever hit failure? Now, that aside, what I'm saying here is just push a little bit harder when things burn. When things get uncomfortable, you don't have to stop. Push even more. Arnold used to say that his rep count started as soon as his biceps started burning. Those are some of the best biceps that the world's ever seen. And I think there was something to that. Say yes to things that scare you. When your business partner tells you that they signed you up for a Spartan race, say, what time should I be there? Even though every cell in your body is screaming, no. Get hungry. In fact, do a fast. There's plenty of health benefits associated with fasting and calorie restriction. But where I think fasting really shines is through mental toughness. Given you don't have a medical condition that would stop you from doing this, most of us are not gonna die if we don't eat for half a day, or even a few days for that matter. It'll get uncomfortable, and it'll probably get really uncomfortable. But after you do it, and you realize that you're capable of doing it, it's gonna be a lot easier to say no to that second piece of cake at the office party, or maybe just say no to it altogether. So you get the point, do things that suck. Do the things that you don't want to do. Pick the road less traveled, as they say. And now while you're doing it, you can think about what's happening at the cellular level. And I guarantee that the more you do these things that you don't wanna do, the more you push through the pain, the less hold life will have on you. Life will start feeling a lot easier. Tasks you once thought were hard will now be a walk in the park. You'll build the mental toughness and the resilience to do whatever it is in life that you want to do. And now, after you hit like and subscribe, get off your ass and get to the gym. And while you're doing so, listen to this video so you can learn a little bit more. I'll see you guys in the next one.